Before we begin tonight's lesson, let's go to God in prayer. We know that it, it takes the spirit to understand spiritual things, and we need to ensure that we're in fellowship as we go to take in his word. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight extremely eager to take in your word, Lord, to, Lord, to learn the lessons that you intend for us to take from this uh, particular passage of Scripture. Lord, we're, we're grateful for having the completed canon of Scripture, these, these words meant to instruct us 2,000 years after they were written, Lord. The, the, the forethought of the plan continues to amaze me, that, that the lessons from back then are still just as applicable today uh, as they were in the times that they were written. They're timeless. Lord, we, we, we thank you for the ease uh, to come to your word. We thank you for the freedom to come to your word uh, as we will to, 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 to praise you freely, Lord. We, we trust in you during these difficult times in, in this world, on this planet, uh, when, when the groaning of the world becomes ever more audible. We trust in you that everything is happening according to your plan, Lord, and, and trust in you entirely. Please still our minds and our anxieties and, and quiet the outside world, Lord, so that we can focus solely on you and your word. And all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. So, welcome everyone to a bit of an odd Wednesday night service. Uh, you've got me for at least another session. And so, of course, I'll be continuing my study on the book of Romans. Last Sunday, we finished up the last 13 verses of chapter 8, which is just a beautiful chapter. And it's bookended by the promises of eternal security. 8.1 says, there is, now, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then skipping down to verses 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither life or the Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor the things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing created shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Throughout that chapter that was written to the believers in Rome, Paul wanted there to be no doubt that once they were found to be in Christ, nothing can undo that. Chapter 8 was filled with promises. The first part com, uh, is committed to those that, uh, to be found in Christ and how they should be led by the Spirit and not live according to the flesh. It goes on to say that we as saved individuals no longer belong to the realm of the flesh because we have died with Christ and are spiritually new creatures. That not only did we die spiritually along Christ when it comes to sin, but also, so also did we die to the law, which is of works, because we now live in the law of the Spirit. It is because of that we have an obligation to put off the things of the flesh, to live the way God intends us to. Paul then shifts to speaking on life's trials. We see in Romans 8, 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For creation awaits eagerly in expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to the frustration, not by its own choice, but by the, the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. He explains that the Spirit was given to help us through these times, that we are intended to keep our focus on the Lord during trials and not get bogged down by the trials of this life. Not only is the Spirit there to assist us in having the mind of Christ, to connect us with the Father, but even when we are incapable of voicing our own concerns, so bad may our grief be that the Spirit intercedes on our behalf, putting voice to our groanings before God. We also covered uh, my, my favorite verse, which is found in uh, 8, 8, verse 28, last Sunday. And we know that all, all things, that it, we know that in all things, God works for the good, for those who love Him or, and are called according to His purpose. That's not to say that things will always be good, not that you won't suffer alongside unbelievers on this planet. Plenty of martyred Christians can speak to that, but this tells us that for those that love God and have been called according to His purpose, then everything that occurs to us on this planet is working toward good. 
it will end up good. And that's a promise. That's who, that's how we deal with these trials in life because we know that this life is ultimately fleeting, a passing moment. So then we, we, we get to tonight's verse. We'll be looking at the first 13 verses of chapter 9 if you'd like to follow along to have something to look at. Paul makes somewhat of a jarring transition of topics here in our first verse uh, of this evening. But you can see his mindset at work if you look at it long enough. The first two verses in chapter 9 read, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience, conscience also bears also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. This is a, grass, a drastic turn from Paul writing in, the depth, in depth about the security of our faith, how nothing can sh shift us from positional sanctification, that those that are found in Christ should be unshakable in our faith because we know how the story will end. We take comfort that nothing can remove us from God's hand once He's welcomed us into His fold. And from that, He turns to dropping some truths that might be hard to swallow, ones that greatly unsettle Him. Firstly, in verse 1, He lets them know that what He's about to say is truth. That the Spirit is His witness. And I, and I like this idea. I spoke about it months ago uh, when I was talking, uh, I don't remember what particular uh, chapter we were in, but I was talking about how you can sin without, without realizing it, and then cu coming to the sudden realization that you're out of fellowship uh, by the changing of your actions, by you, you, you see yourself start to slip away. Galatians 5.19 says, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The Spirit acts as your litmus test. If you're going through life and suddenly find yourself responding to situations with anger, or with jealousy, or discord, with selfish ambitions, or any of the other acts of the flesh that were listed, you know that you've fallen out of fellowship, and you need to reflect on your recent past, determine where that was, confess your sins to be purified of all unrighteousness, and be restored to fellowship. So why is Paul giving us this preface before he makes his statement? Why is he attesting that what he's about to say is in fact truth backed by the Holy Spirit? Because Paul did not have the best relationship with his people. On the whole, the Jewish people had denied Christ, persecuted Christians. Paul himself had frequent run-ins run with his people. We see one such example in Acts chapter 21, starting at verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This man, this is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he's, bought, he's brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. And then skipping down to verse 30, the whole city was aroused and people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. So we can tell the majority of Jewish people who had not converted and Paul did not have the best of relationships. Paul knew that others might hear his words and think that he was being biased against uh, his people because his opinion had been colored by their history. He wanted his readers to know that his motivation for saying what he was about to say wasn't in the flesh but in the spirit. His connection with the Spirit told him that he wasn't motivated by malice. It wasn't spite. It was, no, it was from nothing that would remove him from fellowship, from no source of sin. And thus, the Spirit is his witness. The statement that he... And the statement that he had great sorrow and continual grief in his heart for his people. His train of thought is, is apparent in retrospection. He was speaking on the surety of salvation, 
and how the saved have no worries about the end times. So his mind drifts back to his people, those that do have cause for concern. He knows that every one of the members of his people who, did not, who do not place their faith in the Savior would face destruction, eternal condemnation. And that's hard for Paul. He'd lived for those people. He'd lived for those people, though now they saw him as the enemy. So when his mind was on how perfect everything would be in the end, his mind naturally turned to those who would not share in that promise and would not at Judgment Day have hope. We see in verse 3, For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. Paul here is outright saying that who he's referring to uh, is the nation of Israel in the situation facing his countrymen, his people. He completely understands where they will find themselves come Judgment Day without Christ. And we see him here making a bold statement in this verse that Paul wishes that he himself could be cut off from Christ if it meant saving his people. So great is his concern. Now, Paul's already covered in the last chapter that such a thing isn't, impos that isn't even possible, that nothing can remove Paul from God's hand. No force on the planet can achieve such a thing. But that doesn't take any weight out of what Paul is saying here. He's beside himself in his grief. Just because he converted doesn't mean he doesn't still love his people. He spent nearly 30 years engrossing himself into his culture, the Jewish faith, studying. He became somewhat of a zealot. We see in Philippians 3, 4 through 8, that Paul says, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence to flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing that Christ Jesus, my Lord, for, for whose sake I have lost all things. The Jewish culture, the people, the faith were once immensely important to Paul. He dedicated his life to those people, to those ideals. But we see now that he counts all of those things in his life as loss compared to the value of having Christ as his Lord and Savior. Paul, better than most, was well suited to bridge the gap between the Jewish people and Christianity, to understand the fallacies of the Jewish mindset, because he once had held it himself before his instructions from Christ. There he saw the error of his ways, and that instruction of 30 years, and with that instruction, 30 years of indoctrination into the Jewish faith was undone, and Paul understood. Paul knew that he had been wrong, and so he had committed himself to sharing his newfound understanding. Surely if he could just explain it with the right combination of words, surely they would get it, right? But on the whole, his people would not listen to his words. And worse, they persecuted him for his faith, much as Paul had done to the Christians on behalf of the Jewish leadership. Still, Paul says he wishes he could curse himself on the behalf of his brothers and sisters, the people of Israel, if that only he were punished and his people saved, that would be his preference. For verses 4 and 5, we're going to use the end of verse 3 for context starting where he says, my countrymen according to the flesh. And verse 4 starts, who are Israelites? To whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises? In verse 5, of whom are fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Paul here in these verses lists the things that the Jewish people had historic, historically had going for them. He says Israel was given a, ha a head start in the plan of God. They were his chosen people from the early days of the world. Paul touched on this in the opening of chapter 3 of Romans, verse 3, when he said, What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit of circumcision? Much in every way chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God, also translated the words of God. 
The Jews were chosen to carry the words of God to show the world what life and the service of God should look like. He says the Israelites pertain the adoption. We know that God saw them in that light by verses like Exodus 42 or 4, 22, where the Lord was speaking to Moses and instructed him to say, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. God marked his chosen people, adopting them as his firstborn. Paul said that Israel was shown the glory of God, such as in Exodus 24, 17. They were even given covenants, referring to the covenants of Abraham, found in Genesis uh, chapters 12 through 17, of the covenant of David found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the promise of a future covenant found in Jeremiah 31, which reads in verses 31 and 32, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, and not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. We know that Israel was given the law through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 5. They were given services unto the Lord. They were given the temple with which to worship Him. And the promises they were given that were too many to count. God had favored His people, and it was evident through the histories through the histories that Paul knew so well, having committed so much of his life to the Jewish faith and culture. Paul then mentions the fathers of the people of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through whom in the flesh came the Savior of the human race. Christ came through the lineage of which it was promised, keeping God's word and benefiting the whole world, because Christ is over all. How honored should the Jewish people be that through their lineage, through the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the world was saved. But despite all the foreshadowing, despite all the direct instruction from God that a new covenant would be coming, Paul's people refused to see Christ as their Savior. Christ as a gift was rejected by the people of Israel, with John's Gospel telling us in, in, one, in chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own, and his own received him not. We see in the next two verses, six and seven, but it is not the word of God, it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For, our, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your, she, your seed shall be called. We see that Paul next wanted there to be no misunderstanding to what he's saying. He's not saying that the Word of God failed. It didn't fizzle out. It wasn't insufficient to save the Jewish people. God's Word and His promises are perfect. I've, I've used the analogy up here before uh, that, our, that our communications with God like, work like a military radio. You can't both be talking at the same time on these radios. You hold a button when you are sending a transmission and you can't hear what anyone else is saying. But when you let go and you are receiving, you're listening, you hear the responses. When God communicates with us, there is never a problem on the transmitter side. It's always the receiver where the message can get skewed or worse, ignored. We have all manner of ways not to receive God's word, to miss his message. Perhaps you're, you, you're so focused on praying for what you think you need, for what you think would better your life, that you're ignoring God's, God's hand in your life. You've set your mind that this is what you need, and if it's not that, I don't want to hear it. One of the most common problems in the military setting with, com with communicating can be a unmonitored radio. There is a speaker that you can attach to it, but most ro radios don't have that. So if you don't physically have the handset to your ear, it's easy to miss what's being said. And how fitting that the sender can be trans transmitting, can be sending you message after message. But if you aren't listening, you miss it. Israel is told to expect their king, to expect a new covenant. All the transmissions that were sent, but the receiver, the receiver failed to hear that message. We read in Joshua 21, So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, 
just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of all of God's promises to Israel failed. Every one of them was fulfilled. There is nothing that God said he would do for Israel that he, that did, not, he, he did not see come to fruition. It's not the word of God that failed Israel, but they were not all Israel who are of Israel, which is a bit of a confusing statement, forcing you to really step back and look at it to understand it. Context here can help, because Paul's already spoken on this point already in the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 25. For circumcision, circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And then verses 28 and 29, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Paul here was using a, a, a euphemism when he was talking about circumcision. Circumcision being uh, the physical mark of the covenant for all, all Jewish males. In this verse, it was, being a, it was a euphemism for being Jewish. In chapter 2, he explained that being born a Jew does nothing if you cannot perfectly keep the law. If the outside is Jewish, but you cannot perfectly keep the law, you haven't kept your part of the deal. He goes on to say that, even, that, that not even all of the children of Abraham are part of the covenant. We know that Abraham had Ishmael prior to Isaac, and Ishmael didn't make the cut. Nor did, did those of Abraham's later wife, Keturah, with whom he had uh, other offspring. But as we see in Genesis chapter uh, 21, verse 12, but God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondswoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your, she, your seed shall be called. During Christ's earthly ministry, when confronted by a crowd of Jewish people in John chapter 8, we see this exchange. They answered him saying, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Which is exactly the point that Paul is making here. That despite the leg up the Jewish people had compared to Gentiles with, with knowing God, they missed the signs, the instructions, the words of God, and so were lost. They didn't follow in the, in the steps of their ancestors who exhibited faith in the Lord and faith in His plan. Verse 8 tells us that that is those who are children of the flesh. These are not children of God, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. Verse 9, for this is the word of, of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. I've said this a handful of times during our study on the book of Romans, but Paul is an excellent influencer. He's a master craftsman of well-reasoned and logical persuasive arguments. And the logical line he's laying out now for his, his Jewish reader is, look, you already know that not all of Abraham's offspring are children of Abraham. This is something that they, they, they knew, they understood, that not even the most ardent critic uh, among the Jewish people of Paul's could argue with it. It was an understood concept. He says, unless the children are, are of the promise, they are not counted as the seed of Abraham. This too he's touched on previously in the book. Romans chapter 3, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For of those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Paul's already made this point in the book, that it's through the faith that the seed of Abraham are found, not in those of the flesh. Verse 9, uh, in verse 9, Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 17, Abraham fell face down and he laughed and he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Not a, here, Abraham himself 
mentions that he, he knew Ishmael was not under God's blessing. And that God told, us that, told him that Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. And it's through him that the covenant was established in faith, not by blood, not by works, but solely by faith in the plan of God, which culminated with the death, burial, and resurrection of his son. And it was at that vital last step when Israel lost their way, turned from the plan of God they'd struggle to follow for countless generations. Verse 10 tells us that not only this, but when Rebekah had, uh, had also con oh, had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, verse 11, for the children not yet being born, nor having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who also calls. Paul then takes his argument to the next logical step. He goes a step further down Abraham's uh, a lineage. Isaac, who God promised Abraham that his descendants would be blessed through, grew up and married Rebekah. And they had two children, twins, Esau and Jacob. We see in Genesis uh, 25, now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, to our human understanding, we now have multiple sets of people that we might think the covenant should apply to, because all of Abraham's children, eight of them, and now Isaac and Jacob. So, if, if how the Jewish people of Paul's day felt were true, that simply by birthright were they part of the fold, then why is the same not true for so many of Abraham's offsprings? Well, there was a modifier that was given that narrowed it down to Isaac. So, okay, all of Isaac's children must surely be part of the promise. But that's not what we see. God's ways are above our ways. And verse 11 says that the children were not yet born when what will be said in the following verses occurred. Those children had not done any works. They had not gained or lost righteousness. They had, and they, and, uh, though they were born with sinful natures, God was foreshadowing so many days in human history, including the days that, in which Paul was living. When the descendants didn't seek God in faith and never searching for God and therefore never being called out, now this being chosen was not due to the works of the individual, but for those God called, those he knew would seek him. Even in the womb, God saw those twins' days and knew whom would be his servant. And then our final verses for the night, verses 12 and 13, read, It was said to her, the older, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. These verses are also take, take part in Genesis 25. After feeling the, the, child, excuse me, after feeling the children struggling in her belly, Rebecca went to God to inquire as to her situation. And we see in verse 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger, stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Before they were born, God knew which son would have faith, which one would prosper under the covenant. Birth order traditionally played a part in heritage, and that was disregarded here. We covered here today Exodus chapter 4, where the Lord told Moses, told of Moses to tell Pharaoh that Israel was his firstborn. Israel must have been pleased. The firstborn gets the inheritance after all. But God had already showed them, showed them in their beginnings that it doesn't always work that way. That it wasn't the firstborn, but the one who came after in faith who received the blessing. Just the way that, uh, that Jacob was born second and not Esau the eldest who would receive Isaac's blessing, so, so too would it be Gentile or Jewish Christians and not necessarily those of Jewish heritage, to Jewish heritage that will be brought into the kingdom of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 12 says God's words, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. And again, to our human understanding, this can be a bit of a shock. Wow, God, 
God hated Esau. That's a strong word. But did he hate Esau like we use the word hate? The word in Greek is imisesa, which Strong's Concordance lists its uses as I hate, detest, love less, esteem less. And of these, I think love less seems the most fitting. We see Jesus addressing a crowd in Luke 14, verse 25, using the same word. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now I don't feel that Jesus was telling us to have hatred in our hearts for our loved ones. That doesn't pass the smell test when compared to the other times we're told to love everyone in our lives. But it would make sense if, it were, if, if the love and hate were a comparison. Jesus want, wanted to be preeminent in our lives and everything else we love less. We also know that God didn't seek to ruin Esau. We've covered that he would lead a great nation, but he wasn't included in the covenant. So it doesn't seem that he was despised by God. But the God's favor went to Jacob, just as it goes to all who believe through faith in the Son. Faith in the plan, faith that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He died the death that we couldn't bear, took our sins upon ourselves, uh, upon himself, to be that sacrificial lamb so that we could be brought into the kingdom of God knowing that we couldn't do it ourselves, that in the end, if we stood on our own two feet, we would all be laid low. God sent his son to save us. And it is the biggest comfort on this planet you will ever have, eternal security, knowing that this world is not the end for you, that you don't have to seek your glory here because you get to be in his glory on the other side. That the trials of this life that might seem massive when you're only looking at your perspective become so, so small in comparison to the glory that awaits on the other side. If you haven't had the opportunity, if you haven't taken that, 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 that step of faith, trusting in God, I, I hope that you would do so now. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we, we bow before your majesty, before your glory, before your forethought and wisdom, your grace and mercy that is spilled out on us undeserving wretches. On a world that continues to try to besmirch your name, that, that Christians that don't choose to follow your path, that don't actually study but like to think themselves self-righteous, falling short, Lord, you have infinite mercy for us. For Christians, at any time, we can turn to you and confess our sins, and you will bring us back into fellowship, bring us back into communication, bring us back into the fold without a second thought. And for, Christian, I mean, for, for, for unbelievers, for non-Christians, for those in this world that are still lost, if they just turn to your Son, if they just place their faith in Him, in the works of the cross, and your plan, you are willing to save them in an instant. That they can be, they can come to this family and live in your glory forever. Lord, we thank you that you gave us this work in which we can study and see how gracious you were, the chances that were given, the, the instructions, the, the forewarnings. It was all laid out there for us to see. Lord, we trust in your plan. We trust in the events that are occurring in our lives, that they aren't happening randomly, that they aren't happening uh, simply, simply to lay us low, but they are occurring for a reason in your plan. Lord, we ask to be your hands and feet in our lives, that you use us every way you can to expand the kingdom. We ask for guidance and wisdom in doing that. We ask that, that all of us try a bit harder to stay in the word if that's an area in which we falter. And we trust in you in all things. And in all things, in Christ's name, amen.
Thank you, and you're dismissed.